Okay, so so now if I click a button, so you can see it's recording, right? Do you want yes, us to right. record? Well, uh, I think that would be good. I mean, if we want to refer to it or your colleagues refer to it in the future or okay. people that couldn't make it. Okay. So you can start recording when you start your introduction. Okay, so I, I press button, now it's a recording. Probably you can see, have you seen from your side? That's, That's right, on the I top. see it, Yeah, yes. okay, yeah, so I can, okay. Okay, maybe we start then, you know, we, we can more be, because this, uh, the, they can always join this on the way. That's right. Right, so, so, so yeah, today is our great pleasure to have a, a Dr. Organ Guru, uh, in fact, from uh, to join us uh, through the, uh, the the webinar or room, uh, the Dr. Organ Guru uh, got his uh, uh, education from the the Harvard University. Uh, at that time, you know, he uh, worked in the in the uh, Martin Kaplas uh, group. Mm. So so Martin got a Nobel Prize in 2013. Uh, in fact, that project is on the molecular dynamics on the DNA. Then after that, uh, he got his uh, uh, MD from Columbia University, uh, up, um, followed by the surg surgical training at MIT, uh, at, uh, at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, so Dr. Gro then Currently, is a visiting professor uh, in the Sobridge International School of Business and also visiting teaching professor at the Digist. Uh, Digist is a, uh, also uh, is a sister university, a sister uh, university of KAIST, right? Yeah, it's related. Science and technology, it's part of the government ministry, actually. Right, right, right. Very prestigious uh, institutes in Korea. Uh, he also the chief um, marketing officer for the uh, Idware and the Soundmind, and also uh, you have a, uh, you probably you haven't put here. Uh, you also uh, you know act as this uh, uh, the 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 how to say uh, the the grant um, approval for the Samsung for this. Uh, Global health. Oh, yes, that's right. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's also. Previously, I was working at Samsung. Yes, yes. Also, you know, you have all quite a wide range of this uh, experience and activity worldwide. So, uh, you know, by giving the keynote speech and also uh, give probably invited a seminar at the, uh, you know, the top university and the research labs. Uh, today, uh, the Dr. Organ Guru gonna share his experience on the protein electrodynamics and the terahertz medicine. So that is a really um, revolutionary uh, frontier. Uh, it's a, like a new paradigm for the COVID-19 and the medicine. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome um, Organ for the nice seminar. So I, I uh, will just uh, put this virtually. <laughs> yes. So Thank you, you very much, uh, uh, Hyben. Uh, uh, Hyben and I actually go uh, way back several years, and uh, we talked about protein electrodynamics and some of these ideas and potential collaborations. He referenced Samsung, and we were trying to do some projects uh, together. And uh, when he was at Nanyang Te uh, Technological University in Singapore, and uh, congratulations moving to Hong Kong and uh, also a very prestigious institute, uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So we actually go way back and it's a great opportunity to uh, up to date or bring up to date on this uh, uh, interesting field. Uh, what I'll mention is it's always been interesting. Uh, I've been working on it effectively for the past 30 years since the time with Martin Karplus. But uh, with COVID and uh, some of the changes going on scientifically, medically, societally, this uh, has gotten even more increased interest. So this is a very special opportunity to renew this discussion with uh, Hybin. And uh, one of my goals for the webinar is not just to share some ideas here, but hopefully uh, Hybin and, and colleagues uh, 
can uh, go back and we can discuss ways we can move forward some of these projects. And I'll mention one in particular, but of course, things have changed since we met uh, maybe four years ago or so. So maybe there are other ideas as well. So this is just an overview uh, for uh, a broad scientific audience from biologists to physicists about protein electrodynamics and terahertz medicine. So I'll share the screen. Uh, here we go. And uh, first of all, I can be reached at ogangorel at gmail.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, so feel free to uh, connect here. Uh, Hyben, you can see the screen, right? Yeah, very nice, yeah. Great. And um, if there's one takeaway message from this whole presentation, uh, it's this image here of a protein. And this protein, if you can see, uh, I'll show other images later that are larger, but you can uh, see closely that it's actually moving and it's dynamic. And uh, as Hyben mentioned, the, one of the founders and pioneers in dynamics, molecular dynamics was Martin Karplus, who I did my undergraduate work with. And that's why I mentioned these ideas have been uh, uh, brewing, if you will, and being developed in various ways for the past 30 years, uh, all coming out of the central idea that proteins are not static molecules, but they're dynamic. So this is effectively the take home message. So I start with uh, two quotes, uh, two things fill the mind with ever increasing awe and admiration. Uh, they are uh, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. This is attributed to Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher. Might be a little bit strange why uh, a philosophical quote is uh, opening a scientific presentation, but uh, I'm not gonna explain it now, but uh, this will become evident uh, later in the presentation. So I'll be talking about three things, some background, some science, and uh, some applications. I'll also keep in front of me the chat room open. Uh, if anyone wants to interject a question uh, through the Zoom group chat, uh, I'll see it in front of me and uh, we'll either address, uh, you know, during the discussion, repeat the question, et cetera. So that's a fairly efficient way to uh, ask some questions. So I'm welcome to entertain them during the presentation or afterwards. So background, science, and applications. So in terms of uh, background, I'll talk about four questions. One is, what is the future of diagnosis? What is the future of therapy? What is the future of technology? And how does life work? These are kind of the motivating questions behind this whole area of research. So in terms of the future of diagnosis, this is a uh, depiction of the various modalities currently used in medical diagnosis. And there are four major ones. They are x-rays, ultrasound, MRI, and PET. And uh, these four uh, modalities have obviously developed since Röntgen discovered x-rays, another form of electromagnetic probing of biology, uh, if you will. But the interesting fact is that uh, since 1985, no new modalities have essentially emerged. So in other words, invention has stopped as current uh, innovation in medical imaging has been largely incremental. So these are various innovations, multi-slice CT, diffusion MRI, combined modalities such as PET-CT. These are more incremental uh, advances. And so no new fundamental modality has uh, been brought to the market uh, in medical imaging. And one of the concepts is what could be one of these new modalities? And then another uh, concept is that of the future of therapy. This is a graph of number of drugs coming out per research dollars over the past half century. And you can see that uh, this graph is going down. In other words, more money going in, more research going in and less drugs coming out. Uh, recently that has increased a little bit, especially with antibody-based uh, therapies. But in general, this has been a downward slope. And effectively, since the turn of the century, the 21st century, we've had about $1 billion to develop one new drug. Uh, and so apart from incremental advances, innovation effectively has also stalled in pharma. Uh, George Ankopoulos, a very prominent uh, pharmaceutical executive and, and scientist uh, at Regeneron, one of the companies involved in COVID treatments, he uh, uh, described this very succinctly successfully inventing and developing any new drug or vaccine is quantifiably among the hardest things that human beings try to do. So this begs the question, what kind of new paradigms of treatment and therapy could there be? 
given this great difficulty and cost. The third question that I mentioned as part of background is what is the future of technology? And uh, Hyben had mentioned that I worked at Samsung. I was actually in the CTO office working on the future uh, sort of technology strategy and R&D management and so forth. And one of the concepts that we used a lot was that of what's called TRIZ. TRIZ is a methodology for predicting the future of technology on the basis of evolutionary patterns. Uh, for example, weapons become faster, more powerful, uh, more compact and so forth. So this concept uh, generally states that immobile systems will progress ultimately to energy-based systems. So we can apply this to a steering wheel, a rigid steering wheel becomes ultimately electrical steering. The same for door technology, if you will, a single leaf door ultimately leads to a Star Wars like light lock. And so if we apply that concept to medicine, uh, the way medicine works now, Largely, uh, it works through drugs that bind to proteins physically or some sort of surgical hands or instrument that uh, manipulate the body physically. And I call this a matter on matter paradigm. And evolutionarily speaking, just like wired phones go to wireless phones, we can imagine a future energy matter uh, technology. Uh, and so the two questions are, what kind of energy are we talking about? And I'll argue that this is in the terahertz range. And the second question is, uh, when will this happen? And I will also argue that I think it is happening now. And in fact, it may very well be accelerated by the COVID crisis. And the fourth and final question is more fundamental is how does life work? And uh, this is a depiction, very uh, messy diagram of what we call the interaction map of the yeast proteome. In other words, all the proteins in the yeast and how they interact. Another word for this would be the interactome. And you can see there are thousands of proteins, hundreds of thousands of proteins. They're all interacting uh, in various ways. And uh, this randomness soup, if you will, of proteins just bumping into each other gives rise to what we call life. This has always been a mystery to me. I mean, obviously life has many mysteries from a scientific perspective. But uh, there may be other mechanisms these proteins find each other and interact, uh, and not just in terms of these random sort of bumping into each other with a matter like matter. In other words, there might be ways that proteins can sense each other or interact from a distance uh, through electromagnetic uh, means. So those are the four questions, the future of diagnosis, the future of treatment, the future of technology, and how does life work? So where do we go from here? What is the future of medicine and healthcare? And uh, ultimately, uh, sorry about that. Ultimately, uh, how can we better understand the fundamental mechanisms of life? So the story begins uh, over 30 years ago as <clears throat> I've been introduced. Uh, when I was an undergraduate in Martin Karplis's lab, he was professor, he is a professor of chemistry at Harvard University, one of the pioneers in molecular dynamics and simulations of biological macromolecules. And I was sitting uh, in his office at his uh, desk, uh, the round table, and he was explaining to me proteins are neither solids nor liquids, they are something in between. That was a very fascinating uh, way to describe it. I was uh, uh, hooked from there, did my senior thesis, and this whole uh, research that I'll be describing began then. So let's now focus on some science, and I'll talk about proteins, axioms of protein electrodynamics, terahertz medicine, protein dynamics, some scientific questions, electromagnetism and terahertz, some scientific results, conclusions, and technical challenges. Now this presentation by virtue of the fact that terahertz medicine protein electrodynamics spans both biology and physics uh, and quite advanced uh, areas of those respective fields. Some of this may be simplified for members of the audience. Some of it may be uh, more un unfamiliar to members of the audience, so I apologize, but this is the nature of this uh, very interdisciplinary work. So what are proteins? Proteins, of course, are the machinery of life. They are the targets of drugs. What do they look like? Uh, this is an example of myoglobin. It's a oxygen carrier protein, oxygen storage protein uh, that I'll be referencing in a later experiment. It's mostly what we call alpha helical. This is basic fibroblast growth factor. It's mostly beta strand. 
These are two other examples of the androgen receptor and the human growth hormone. These are uh, von der Waals surface diagrams or depictions that show the protein in a static way. You'll see this in a lot of textbooks. But as I emphasized at the beginning of this presentation, these proteins are not static. They are in fact vibrating. The important point from this slide is that proteins come in many different sizes and shapes. They almost have a kind of a personality. And these different sizes and shapes, uh, in contrast to say DNA, which is uh, you know, quite an interesting molecule, of course, but it, from a physical standpoint, it's very elongated, double helix, it's quite uh, monotonous and homogeneous. But proteins are all very different and diverse. And the implications are there that the electromagnetic properties of these proteins will also be quite diverse. So what do these proteins do? Uh, as I mentioned, they're the machinery of life. You have structural proteins, storage proteins, transport proteins, hormones, receptors, contractile proteins for the muscles, defensive proteins like antibodies, and of course, enzymes. Uh, an important concept here, uh, most of you obviously know these facts, is that some proteins will have more of these motions, more of these dynamics, more electromagnetic properties. We call them electrodynamically active. And other proteins are more static, such as structural proteins, more rigid, uh, maybe less charges associated with them. And these proteins will be relatively electrodynamically inactive. So uh, some proteins will fall under this sort of protein electrodynamics realm, and some proteins will be uh, you know, less, less evident. So one of these proteins that's quite electrodynamically active is uh, transport proteins, in particular the voltage-dependent potassium channel. This is part of the nerve cell, that's part of the uh, action potential or the nerve signal. Uh, and this protein in the membrane will actually respond to a voltage change and will have a very large-scale movement in order to allow potassium ions to go across the membrane, thus serving as one component of the action potential, which is a change in the electrical potential on the cell surface. And so you can see this picture of this protein uh, changing, you know, quite uh, uh, markedly in its uh, uh, configuration. Uh, and I don't know if you were able to see that, uh, but it, it opens up and closes uh, as well, and so the potassium can go through. The important point of this uh, picture is that proteins do respond to electrical changes. Uh, in this case, it's a static electric field. And uh, the second point of this slide is that it has these very large scale motions. So if we were to summarize the axioms or principles of protein electrodynamics, resulting in the concept that these proteins, functional elements of life, emit and absorb radiation, we have five axioms. The first one is that proteins vibrate. This is that picture I showed you at the outset of the presentation. Uh, the second is that proteins are charged, and this is uh, acetylcholinesterase, an important protein also for nerve signal uh, transmission. And the red on the surface represents negative charges, the blue represents positive charges, and you can see that there are charges distributed around the protein. Uh, in general, most proteins are overall neutral, not charged, but there are charges uh, on the surface of the protein, in the case of soluble proteins, and uh, as well as dipoles. So uh, if we combine this idea by uh, applying Maxwell's equations, or namely the laws of electromagnetism, uh, that state that vibrating charges will emit and absorb electromagnetic radiation, that's how radios and smartphones work, then therefore we can conclude, as a matter of fact, that proteins emit radiation and that proteins absorb radiation. So these, just like the radios I mentioned, are effectively acting like transmitters and receivers. Uh, this is a paper that I'll reference later that shows bacteria rhodopsin, a protein and also membrane protein has emission about 900 gigahertz or 0.9 terahertz. And this is another protein that I'll reference in a later uh, slide called lysozyme and has a sharp resonance at 2.1 terahertz in terms of absorption. So again, the five principles, vibration of proteins, proteins are charged, the laws of electromagnetism, which are indisputable facts, and of course, proteins emitting <clears throat> and absorbing electromagnetic radiation, respectively.
So if we go to protein dynamics in more detail, this is the original paper by Martin Karplus uh, in Nature in 1977 on the dynamics of folded proteins. Uh, and he worked, he and Bruce Gellin and Andrew, uh, Andy McCammon worked on bovine pancreatic trypsin inhibitor, doing those simulations that I described. And eventually, uh, not directly with this work, but uh, a whole body of work, of course, Martin Karplus got the Nobel Prize in 2013, alongside uh, Michael Levitt and Arya Warshell, also pioneers in molecular dynamic simulations. So then the question is, these proteins are vibrating, what are the frequencies? And there's been a lot of studies in this regard, so I'll highlight one of them. It was fairly early, uh, looking at myoglobin, that oxygen carrier that I uh, described to you. And uh, this is combining these simulation results, the Martin Karplus uh, systems of molecular dynamics combined with neutron scattering spectra, which is an experimental probe of these protein dynamics. So this is the theory. Uh, this is the experiment. Uh, on the right is the uh, molecular dynamics simulations. On the left is the neutron scattering. And you can see that there is a peak of frequencies that correspond, number one, between the theory and the experiment. Uh, roughly in the same uh, range. And in terms of the actual frequencies, about 450 to 600 gigahertz, 0.45 to 0.6 terahertz. Terahertz being 10 to the 6, uh, the 10 to the 12th uh, cycles per second. Uh, and there are two important takeaways from this. One is that the theoretical simulations correlate with the experimental results. And the second is that we're talking, when we're talking about terahertz, which is a wide range, we're talking about frequencies that are largely in the lower terahertz or what we call sub terahertz region of several hundred gigahertz to a uh, low number of uh, terahertz. So in general, other studies have showed that proteins are uh, having electromagnetic uh, behavior at these frequencies. So I wanted to contrast low frequency terahertz with high frequency infrared motions. Everybody is familiar with infrared. It is the signature, the electromagnetic signature of heat and that heat being manifested as the vibrations of bonds uh, of molecules and uh, uh, their movements and so forth. So in general, these infrared motions are very high frequency, uh, small bonds or not small bonds, but uh, small regions of a molecule, in other words, individual bonds or rotations or angular, angular motions among atoms. So in other words, infrared is sensitive to small changes in the backbone atoms of those proteins I described. But since these backbone atoms are largely equivalent between different proteins, uh, the differences between proteins are effectively washed out. So these are a whole series of different proteins. They have a uh, peak uh, in uh, this region, and they're roughly you know, all the same. But with terahertz, and this is a study with hemoglobin and myoglobin that I'll describe uh, uh, shortly, differences between proteins, even similar ones, are apparent. And large-scale motions, such as the um, voltage-dependent potassium channel that I had uh, shown earlier, are responsible for protein function. So if we summarize this in a table and contrast low frequency terahertz with high frequency infrared, that's the electromagnetic range. These are large scale subunit motions of the proteins. The infrared is the small, very uh, backbone and small groups of atoms uh, vibrations. So they're both techniques that are sensitive to overall changes in the protein shape, in other words, conformational change. But in terms of distinguishing between proteins, the applicability to medical diagnosis, the functional significance, and therefore the applicability to medical therapeutics, terahertz offers you know, more possibility than infrared. So some scientific questions that are raised by this fundamental concept of protein electrodynamics. Do different proteins vibrate at different frequencies? The answer is yes. Can we identify different proteins based on their spectrum? The answer is yes, but not easy at least for now, and the answers to these two questions underlie the concept of diagnosis or using this for diagnostic purposes. Uh, another important question is the anharmonicity of the motion. In other words, how much is this a very sharp resonance or is this very uh, dampened? Uh, this may depend. As I highlighted earlier, some proteins might not have a lot of electrodynamic behavior. Uh, 
other proteins may have more charges, may have more motions, so they may have more electrodynamic behavior. And of course, there's the influence of the solvent and other uh, constituents around the proteins that may dampen those motions. So it may depend on the protein, it may depend on the situation, so we don't know, fully know the answer to this question. And then can one influence protein function by modulating their vibrations? In other words, can we change the protein function uh, by modulating their vibrations or their uh, motions? Uh, the answer to this is fundamentally unknown, but uh, there's obviously indications of that, and I'll show some examples uh, later. So how far might these electromagnetic wave fields propagate? Some very preliminary calculations, maybe one to two millimeters potentially. Uh, could protein electrodynamics mediate specific attractive forces between proteins? In other words, could uh, one protein by virtue of its uh, vibrations create an electromagnetic field that uh, resonates with another protein with a similar vibrational uh, behavior? And so could there be some sort of uh, force between them? So could proteins effectively communicate over a distance? So that's a little bit of biology. Let's go a little bit now into the physics. What is terahertz? Uh, it is the electromagnetic energies between the microwave and the infrared, the microwave on the low energy side and infrared on the high energy side. And you can see this in this electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and it's referred to as a terahertz gap. And that's because until recently, the radiation in this region was very, has been very difficult to engineer because it lies between the electronic uh, domains of the spectrum and the photonic domains of the spectrum. By electronics, we're talking about using unbound electrons or conducting band electrons like in metals to create uh, changes in the energy levels, whereas photonics uses valence band or bound electrons, such as in atoms and molecules, to create also shifts in energy levels. So photonics is higher energy, electronics is lower energy, but it's not just a matter of degree. There's a fundamental difference between those two uh, areas and the terahertz region falls right between them. But ironically, terahertz is all around us, emitted by all living organisms as we're all composed of proteins. So we're literally emitting terahertz. So even though engineering is difficult, uh, this is actually quite natural. Uh, and terahertz are also uh, strongly absorbed by water, which presents uh, both a challenge and opportunity. So in addition to protein dynamics being a frontier of biology, uh, terahertz is also the last frontier in the electromagnetic spectrum or in physics. So this is a chart of power on the vertical axis and frequency. And you can see the photonics approaches in red uh, have pretty good power. This is a logarithmic scale. And likewise, the electronics approaches have pretty good power. You can have you know, strong transmitters. But as you approach the terahertz region, the power goes down. And that's because you're fundamentally going up frequency from the electronic side or down frequency from the photonic side. So you lose efficiency and so forth. Uh, and there's some other optoelectronic methods and then free electron lasers, which are you know, very large systems and not necessarily very practical, uh, allow some higher degrees of power uh, output. So what are the natural sources of terahertz radiation? You remember that uh, Kant quote, two things fill the mind with new and increasing admiration at all, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. Well, the reason I put that quote is that uh, there are two sources of terahertz radiation are the cosmic microwave background, and that's a depiction of this, and of course, living organisms. So the starry heavens above and the moral law within are the two sources of terahertz radiation, life and the cosmos. Now that cosmic microwave background radiation has two uh, sort of uh, implications. One is it's a black body uh, config, you know, distribution of radiation. So the terahertz is not the peak, the peak is in the microwave, which is one reason why it's called obviously cosmic microwave background. But about 10 billion years ago, as this residue of the Big Bang was cooling, the peak was actually in the terahertz region and would be called the cosmic terahertz background. The other implication of this is that a lot of terahertz physics comes from astrophysics, which is about as far scientifically from medicine as it gets. And so one of the challenges in this whole area has been the integration between very disparate uh, and separate fields. 
Uh, now, this is not just scientifically. There has been a lot of practical applications of this. So the NYPD uses a T-Rave machine that they evaluate it uh, that can detect uh, concealed weapons because uh, people being composed of proteins will emit terahertz. It goes through the clothing, but a gun or a knife uh, underneath the clothing that's composed of pro uh, metals will not emit terahertz. And so the contrast can give evidence of this concealed weapons. And of course, this is a principle used in airports with millimeter wave scanners, which uh, work at a lower energy, <clears throat> but essentially the same principle. The body's emitting the millimeter waves, but the concealed weapons are uh, not. And so the contrast can be used. So there are two important technical challenges in terahertz radiation. As I described, the terahertz sources of sufficient power and spectral resolution, spectral resolution referring to the tightness of the frequency band. And the second one is water absorption. Now, water, of course, is a small molecule. And I described terahertz being absorbed by large molecules. So there's a little bit of a uh, paradox there. How can a small molecule, H2O, absorb terahertz? Well, in fact, uh, water molecules themselves are not absorbing the terahertz radiation. It's the hydrogen bonded networks as uh, depicted here. In other words, a large macromolecule effectively of water that's absorbing the terahertz. Now you can imagine liquid water has all these different configurations of hydrogen bonding that's changing constantly uh, and dynamically. So the energy levels that are absorbing the terahertz are quite broad. And so water absorbs terahertz. Now that is both an opportunity because we can use this to uh, test for water content as a means of imaging, but of course it's also a challenge in terms of the penetration of terahertz into the body. So if we combine all of these to uh, describe principles of terahertz medicine, there are two sides, diagnosis, the imaging to look at structural features largely by water content, and the spectroscopic approach to look at functional aspects for specific proteins. And then, of course, the therapeutic side, some sort of energy-specific, protein-specific modulation. And that's where I describe the future of medicine being terahertz medicine in terms of energy-matter interactions. So three principles of terahertz medicine, the concept of resonance. In other words, the proteins are the targets and they resonate with a certain frequency or a combination of frequencies. Localization, which is uh, these tissues are localized and uh, we can... Uh, zoom in on those uh, regions. So in a sense, it's kind of a surgical device, but it's acting like a drug in a localized area. And of course, functional relevance. Uh, in other words, the proteins are either activated or inactivated. So one of the, as I move into some of the experiments, uh, important consideration is that of the difference between what we call time domain and frequency domain spectroscopy. So spectroscopy, effectively the probing of matter through electromagnetic radiation, <clears throat> uh, can be probed in two basic ways. One is to do a whole range of frequencies all at once and do what we call a time domain measurement. And so you do many frequencies all at once and see how the <clears throat> matter responds. So this is the principle behind NMR or MRI and, and many other techniques. And in fact, about 99% of terahertz science is done with time domain measurements. It's a very elegant technique. It's very quick and there are commercial sources available of broadband uh, terahertz radiation. The other approach, uh, more classical approach, is frequency domain spectroscopy, where you probe or sample at individual frequencies uh, separately and uh, producing very tight uh, continuous wave, tight spectral resolution, high power terahertz sources at specific frequencies is very uh, difficult and most of these are not commercially available. So most experiments have been done in time domain, very few experiments done in frequency domain. This has very important implications because as I mentioned, the water uh, hydrogen bonded network is very, uh, has a very broad range of energy. So when you probe a biological sample with a time domain or broadband radiation, you are exciting all those energies and the signal gets very complex, if not impossible to de determine. So as I'll argue through some of these experiments, the future of terahertz as applied to biomedicine is most likely in the frequency domain measurements. <clears throat>
So one experiment that I did while I was at site in collaboration with the Pohang Accelerator Lab in Hanyang University, uh, studying myoglobin and hemoglobin. Uh, hemoglobin is a large version of myoglobin. It's in other words, four of these myoglobin sort of units, globin units uh, together. So it's about four times the size. And we did a terahertz absorption experiment. So this is the uh, different spectra with the control and this is the absorption spectra. This is with Sangan Ryu at Hanyang University. It was a time domain experiment with a powder sample and these are various uh, parameters. So you had three different proteins, bovine hemoglobin, which is from cow, uh, myoglobin, the smaller molecule, and human hemoglobin, red, green, and blue. And some of the, the most important distinguishing feature of this spectra that strikes you is that it's not very you know, sharp. So you might say, well, this is not very interesting, but actually this is one of the few spectra that showed uh, specific features that can be distinguished among proteins. So for example, the uh, green, which is the myoglobin, smaller molecule absorbs much more at higher frequencies. So there's a difference between myoglobin and hemoglobin. Blue and red are different species of hemoglobin and they show an opposite trend. Uh, not accounted by artifacts. So there's a species specificity among proteins that are actually quite similar. And then there's a potential emission or Stokes shift. In other words, you have absorption at the higher frequency, the protein absorbs that energy and pumps it out at the lower frequency. And so uh, negative absorption uh, is uh, emission. So this is an important scientific result but it raises a lot of questions because it's not very uh, sharp, as I mentioned. So how can you really use it for diagnosis? You know, what's the application of this? Uh, it's, it's a messy spectrum and so forth. But sharp protein residences indeed exist. And this is another study out of uh, the University of Buffalo with lysozyme, which is a protein that can be very readily crystallized. And a sharp residence about, uh, 1.5 terahertz was observed uh, in their studies. Now these degrees from minus 63 to 160 degrees are not temperature degrees, but are the angle of a polarized terahertz beam with a specific crystal face. As I mentioned, lysozyme is readily crystallizable. So crystal being organized array of uh, these proteins. And that means that the dipoles are aligning with the terahertz beam and so the signal is becoming much sharper as opposed to a randomly distributed protein. So this is a very important encouraging result of obviously crystals are highly idealized uh, situations, but this says that intrinsically there are sharp signals to some of these proteins, maybe not all, but some. What was even more intriguing, uh, later the Markelsus group followed up with these motions as they map them out, changing with biological function. This is, this is the same lysozyme uh, showing a hinging motion. This is the overall transition dipole of the motion. This is the lysozyme you can see in yellow uh, with a inhibitor. So that is the inactivated lysozyme. So active on the left, inactive on the right. It's a different kind of motion, twisting motion. So with the inhibitor, the transition dipole of the motion shifts. Uh, as I mentioned, proteins can emit terahertz. Uh, this is bacterial rhodopsin, a uh, study that showed that it emits around 0.9 uh, terahertz. And uh, cancer and protein electrodynamics. This is another Martin Karplus article that investigated the relationship between protein function and molecular dynamics, a very key paper. And this is a SARC protein, which is a, a cancer protein. This is the mutated cancer protein. So the cancer protein on the left is normal. And on the right, it's uh, associated with uh, certain sarcomas and other cancers. The red is what we call a heat map of the motion. It's a very simplified depiction of the overall motion of the uh, protein. And you can see the cancer proteins are different than normal proteins. So in another study, with uh, uh, when I was at Psych with Ohio State University in Kubalai Sertel and Niro Narhar, we evaluated terahertz imaging using time domain or broadband terahertz spectroscopy of cancer tissues from lung and small intestine malignancies. Uh, 
make a long story short, uh, based on the absorption coefficient and also reflection spectra, et cetera, we found differences between normal and cancer tissue. Uh, we also wanted to apply this concept to Alzheimer's disease. The concept of Alzheimer's, as you know, is a dementia that begins with the deposition of amyloid protein, a predominantly beta sheet protein that uh, forms uh, aggregations in the brain. These ultimately cause neurons to be lost and uh, dementia. So we hypothesized that the uh, amyloid protein with these large patterns and maybe different uh, vibrational dynamics uh, may show up as a terahertz signal. Uh, so we did broadband time domain spectroscopy, as I said, not necessarily ideal for biomedical applications, reflection mode as opposed to uh, absorption. We compared uh, frozen formalin fixed paraffin embedded uh, tissue, so uh, biopsy samples of normal and Alzheimer's disease hippocampus. We compared with histopathology and Professor Sertel and his group did an electromagnetic model of myelinated axon. So this is the light microscopy. This is the terahertz image. Uh, to make a long story short, we saw differences in the absorption spectra, reflection spectra between Alzheimer's and controlled tissues. We also looked at gray matter, which has the cells, and white matter, which has the axons. And the amyloid is deposited in the gray matter. And our original hypothesis was that more terahertz changes would be observed in the gray matter. But actually, we saw more of these changes in the white matter. So in other words, some aspect of the axon, as opposed to the cell body or the region around the cell body, was manifesting more differences in this spectral region. And so we saw a strong correlation between Alzheimer's and tissue uh, image contrast. Uh, next steps to refine the technology. As I mentioned, we saw white matter changes, which imply additional applications to multiple sclerosis and other myelin disorders, and continuous wave techniques, as I described. In other words, the uh, frequency domain techniques may offer greater specificity as based on the protein electrodynamics concept. Another study that we were doing, not I shouldn't say a study, but technology development was at the University of Texas, Dallas. This is Dr. Kenneth O. Uh, Hybin Su was talking about Samsung grants. So a lot of this was worked on you know, with uh, Samsung. He developed an integrated terahertz source and sensor on a chip. Uh, this is a depiction of the chip. So in other words, a CMOS chip, very small, miniaturized, potentially inexpensive, producing terahertz radiation and also sensing uh, terahertz radiation. So the concept would be some sort of ultimately handheld device like a Star Trek tricorder that could uh, be used. So can one modulate protein function via terahertz? That's an important question. Uh, there was a recent study just from last month of propagation of terahertz of radiation energy through aqueous layers by a group out of Japan. This is actin. Uh, the control. This is after terahertz of radiation. You can see the actin networks are disrupted. They uh, correct it or accommodate it for heat changes because terahertz is related to infrared, so there is also a heating effect. And this appears to be some sort of mechanical effect. So it's not exactly the same as the protein electrodynamics concept, but clearly protein distribution and ultimately protein function can be influenced by uh, terahertz. So the overall conclusions from this work are number one, or in four categories, proteins, tissues, applications, and technology. So with respect to proteins, definite signals are observed with proteins. Most low frequency motions, the functionally significant motions, are in the sub-terahertz range. As I mentioned, frequency domain or continuous wave spectroscopy may be better able to detect these, but the issue is they have lower power. And uh, a study which we got granted a patent on, uh, which I didn't show in this uh, presentation, is that of 2D spectroscopy. This is work with Keith Nelson at MIT, where just like 2D NMR, you can separate out some of these complex spectra. Now, in terms of tissues, different types of tissues can be distinguished by terahertz imaging, normal and pathologic tissues in particular, and we've demonstrated applications in cancer and Alzheimer's disease. Now, in terms of applications, we have two major ones on the imaging, on the diagnostic side, imaging, in which we leverage the water contrast, such as the uh, cancer studies we did in spectroscopy, 
focusing on proteins, label-free, native, non-ionizing, and I'll talk about projects uh, underway in this latter category. And then finally, in terms of technology, high power, pulsed, continuous wave, single frequency or multi-frequency are the way to do in the future. For biomedical applications, sources must be optimized in the sub-terahertz range. Many experiments have been done, you know, five, six terahertz, et cetera, with inconclusive results, but terahertz is not, you know, uh, all the same. And as I'm describing, the sub-terahertz is more relevant. And then there's the possibility of miniaturization and cost reduction via silicon-based CMOS platforms. One important problem with the terahertz is that water uh, absorption, which leads, of course, to water penetration or lack thereof. So there are four ways that I think we can overcome this. One is to focus on the range in the sub-terahertz. This graph shows you that uh, this is terahertz on the um, horizontal axis, absorption on the vertical axis. You can see that significantly less water absorption at the lower frequencies. So in other words, if we're going to do terahertz medicine, we should focus on the lower frequencies. Second one is the tunability. And the tunability is very important for two reasons. One is that uh, if you do broadband, you excite all the water and all that water is exchanging energy and uh, through the hydrogen bonds and so forth. And that will attenuate or disperse the radiation effectively limiting the penetration. Uh, so if you have a single frequency, you're not going to excite as much of that energy. The second reason why tunability, in other words, single frequency or specific frequency is important is the concept of water windows. And this is well established in the microwave domain where uh, microwave is not uniformly absorbing uh, by water, but there are certain areas of transmissibility called water windows. And there's evidence that the same may be true also in the terahertz region. Of course, when you do broadband, it doesn't matter you're not taking advantage of these water windows. The third approach is to use pulsed radiation, uh, about 10 picoseconds, and that's effectively you put the radiation through fast enough or faster than the water can uh, disperse it through these hydrogen bond networks. And then of course, higher power sources using Dear Lambert as basically paradigm of radiation penetration. So back to the physics. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the electronic sources and we have the photonic sources based on unbound and bound electrons, respectively. On the photonic sources, we have direct lasers, uh, uh, electro-optical conversion. On the electronic sources, we have vacuum sources and solid state. Uh, all of these produce broadband except for the solid state. And this is a little bit of a simplification. But what I mean by this is if we look at the lower frequency range and the concept of using continuous wave, I believe that the most promising technology for biomedical applications is the solid state electronic sources. Finally, let's talk about some applications. I'll go through some of this very quickly because this is more for discussion with uh, uh, Professor Su and his uh, HQ US HK UST, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology colleagues that we can consider potential collaborations and uh, partnerships. So in terms of applications, why new medicine, what are the potential applications, terahertz light switch, electromagnetic taxol for cancer, neuromodulation, antibiotic resistance, resistant antibiotics. Uh, I know that's a little bit uh, tricky. Uh, drug screening, protein-protein interaction affinities, new paradigms for COVID, why now with terahertz, concept of a tricorder, and uh, bring this together, uh, meaning that it's more than just technology. So as I mentioned, we fundamentally need new approaches to diagnosis and treatment. This was the graph of medical imaging, showing the lack of specificity and lack of new modalities. This was the graph of biopharma and the uh, relative stalling of innovation in biopharma and unsustainable costs, technology evolution from matter to matter or matter on matter to matter to on energy. So energy on matter will be the future paradigm of medicine. Uh, in some ways it's inevitable. And what are the benefits? Greater specificity, more non-invasive, greater effectiveness, lower cost, more rapid therapy development, 
and a convergence of medicine and surgery. So we'll go over some of these in, in terms of the applications. This concept of electromagnetic medicine is not new. Uh, this is Time Magazine just from last year, why it's time to take electrified medicine seriously. Uh, Google has gone into this area with the Verily. Uh, Galvani Bioelectronics is joint venture between Verily and GlaxoSmithKline. So drug companies are interested. Uh, there's research teams. This is the one in the Czech Republic led by uh, Professor Shifra, a friend of mine, and uh, he, uh, you can see his word map, sub terahertz, protein, control function, terahertz, imaging. These are all concepts that are brewing and people are exploring more detail. I should note that uh, these electrified medicine, Galvani Electro Bioelectronics and Verily are a little bit different. It's uh, the electroceutical concept. Uh, it's not protein electrodynamics, terahertz medicine per se, but the point is bioelectromagnetics more generally is getting increasing interest uh, in the field. So what are some of the potential applications? One of the concepts uh, that uh, Professor Sue and I have uh, discussed is that of cancer. I'll talk about this later. Another one is in microbial disease, uh, Alzheimer's or autism with the neuronal development. Uh, diabetes with wound healing and many more. This is a platform technology that can revolutionize both diagnostic and therapeutic medicine. So one uh, key experiment that I thought would be very interesting is that of a terahertz light switch to control bioluminescence. So these are the fascinating uh, bioluminescent uh, jellyfish. This is a firefly, so visible light being emitted by proteins, in particular uh, Luc uh, Luc Luc Luciferase, uh, a protein that is involved in this uh, process. And this protein uh, can, if it has this dynamic activity, can be controlled through terahertz radiation. In other words, use terahertz to literally turn on and turn off the bioluminescence. And so this would be a cell-free bioluminescence extract, terahertz frequency scanning experiment with the continuous wave or frequency domain observe for on-off effect, correlate with molecular dynamic simulations. In effect, this would be a, a very profound proof of concept experiment. Uh, I've discussed this with Holding New, uh, another Martin Karplus graduate uh, from Kansas State University, but uh, we haven't uh, you know, made progress on this yet. Uh, Professor Sue, Hybin Sue and I have discussed electromagnetic taxol uh, this is uh, the microtubule. It's involved in uh, cancer cells dividing. And one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful uh, drug for uh, cancer is Taxol. And Taxol inhibits the depolymerization of these microtubules and inhibits the division of the cells. Unfortunately, Taxol uh, goes throughout the body systemically and affects all cells that are dividing and the very serious side effects of Taxol uh, are one of its limiting factors. But if you can have an electromagnetic Taxol that affects the microtubules in a focused way, working as a drug, but being focused like a device, we would call that an electromagnetic Taxol. And so start with a cancer cell line, determine the terahertz spectrum of tubulin and microtubules more generally, set up experiments, control Taxol, terahertz, analyze the results, and this is something that we've talked about with Hybin Su. Uh, neuromodulation is another possibility. I have an honorary fellowship at the University of Melbourne. I've talked with Stan Scafidas. They've developed a bioprinted human cortex. Can we influence nerve cell development through terahertz? Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Fadel Samate, another friend of mine from a previous work that I've done, uh, proton pump switch, he's now at Yale. We've talked about experiments where that bacteria adopts and at the 1.9 or the 0.9 terahertz, it's a proton pump. We can turn it on and off using terahertz again as a proof of concept. Uh, we've been talking about COVID-19 as a pandemic. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of antibiotic resistance. In other words, bacteria that are incurable that could lead to another pandemic. And this is what we call the post-antibiotic era. Uh, common infections and minor injuries can kill it is not an apocalyptic fantasy, a very real possibility for the 21st century. People have warned about COVID. This is a warning about antibiotic resistant antibiotics. So antibiotics are molecules uh, that drugs that bind to proteins typically, 
such as those involved in cell synthesis or protein synthesis on bacteria, these bacterial proteins mutate, so the drug is not effective anymore. It's very difficult to develop a new drug to address that. But if we can influence those bacteria electromagnetically, the mutations would involve some change in the dynamics. So the uh, optimized uh, therapy would involve some change in the frequency. So the development of an uh, antibiotic, electromagnetic antibiotic, would be much faster and easier, personalizable, if you will, than the development of a whole new drug should we encounter antibiotic resistance. So that's why I call it resistance resistant antibiotic therapy. And of course, this is true for antiviral targets as well. So for example, with HIV, the antivirals, uh, in the beginning, those HIV uh, developed a lot of resistance very quickly. Another concept that we talked about with the Institute Pasteur is drug screening. Uh, you use uh, robotic drug screening methods, whether it be with bacteria or other conditions on a platform, try different drugs, but instead of different drugs, we could try different terahertz frequencies. Answering this question, can one influence protein function by modulating their vibrations, looking at the uh, phenotype. Similar thing with protein-protein inter, uh, interaction affinities. And I'm gonna end with a little bit about COVID. Uh, most of you are obviously aware of where the virus is. It's genetic material contained within an organic particle that invades living cells and uses the host's metabolic machinery to produce new virus particles. So this is the actual uh, <clears throat> coronavirus, and this is a, a host cell. And this raises the question, are viruses alive? So a virus, as you know, has three parts. It has nucleic acid inside. It has a lipid membrane. It has a spike protein. Uh, the nucleic acid is responsible for the genetic material. The lipid envelope is related to the environmental uh, viability or stability. And finally, the spike protein determines the top target blocked by antibodies and it's also used for testing. So this is a protein. It has a very special characteristic. It binds to the ACE2 pro, uh, protein on the host cell. And so if we can use the protein electrodynamics related to the spike protein, that can raise possibilities for diagnosis and treatment, which I'll talk about. So are viruses alive? No, I had asked that question. There are only two ways to get rid of a virus, to physically destroy it or to clear it by the immune system. Antibiotics cannot kill it. So uh, there's really never going to be a drug for COVID or other viruses. There must be a way of destroying it, if you will, or enabling it to be cleared. So when we go to COVID, we have a handheld thermal scanner. Most of you are familiar with this device. Uh, it's become very ubiquitous. Uh, airports, restaurants, public space, etc. And this is basically uh, testing for infrared emission from the forehead or whatever. The body's emitting infrared. If you could imagine, instead of this instrument being sensitive to infrared, but being sensitive to terahertz, specifically terahertz emitted by the spike protein, uh, then uh, that would represent not just a temperature sensor, of course, but it would represent a immediate real-time detection of COVID uh, virus. So uh, I gave a seminar at the Middle Eastern Technical University back uh, early June, a uh, similar seminar, and I appreciate this opportunity here in Hong Kong. And based on that, uh, approximately a month and a half later, or, or a little over a month later, we've submitted or about to submit a proposal with a surface enhanced plasmonic terahertz absorption to identify biological molecules. So this is Professor Hakan Altan at the METU and uh, Professor Min Sok Kim, a colleague of mine at Digis. And we'll be basically trying to develop ultimately a handheld uh, COVID detector or, or could be any virus for that uh, matter, uh, based on using surface plasmons uh, to enhance that signal and a, uh, frequency specific or continuous wave terahertz spectrometer, not a broadband. So those are the two important uh, innovations related to that. So this is the terahertz, this is the surface plasmons, the bio samples on the surface, uh, maybe from the breath or a sample, uh, liquid sample and terahertz being emitted that uh, hopefully we are aiming for that specific resonance to be amplified. So this raises a question with Hong Kong, you know, what projects could we do together? Uh, and we can talk about that uh, shortly. There's a question from uh, 
uh, participants, can you please explain why solid state devices would be better for biomedical application? Uh, as I've emphasized, single wave, continuous wave frequency domain is likely to be better for biomedical uh, because of the nature of the interaction with water, the complexity of the signals, the fact that we're trying to isolate specific proteins with specific frequencies and so forth. The many of the other techniques uh, on the photonic side and the vacuum approach on the electronic side involve broadband radiation. And as I mentioned, that's one reason why it's so common. The one technique, among the one technique, but the major technique that allows for continuous wave is on the solid state or CMOS based approaches. The other advantage to the solid state or CMOS approaches is that it is accessible to the lower frequency range, which as I argued is for biomedical applications, whereas the photonics approaches in general start at higher frequency from the mid IR, et cetera, and go down to the upper terahertz range. So last thing I wanna talk about is on the therapeutic side for COVID, because that's obviously interesting to everybody. Now there's an interesting correlation with the military. If one can modulate protein function electromagnetically for medical purposes, one can also do this for military purposes. So in other words, if you uh, inactivate a protein for treating some disease, you can also inactivate that protein to kill somebody, just to put it bluntly. That of course uh, is important to stop somebody or whatever, that's a military goal. And in fact, a lot of the terahertz region research has been also on the military side. This is out of the US Army Research Laboratory, used for battlefield sensing and communications. Of course, 5G and 6G are approaching the terahertz range. So communication is a very important part of this. But what I'll argue is that the military, which is uh, uh, more secret, is also developing this for therapeutic applications. And I'll give you an example. This is uh, you know, not meant to be a political you know, seminar, but I want to uh, play this. Uh, one second. I have to change uh, the speed. which I find to be very interesting. So supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. And I think you said that hasn't been checked, but you're gonna test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're gonna test that too. Sounds interesting. Right. So uh, the reason I mention this is that this was a very interesting, I mean, obviously this was a very controversial point about injecting uh, uh, disinfected and so forth and highly ridiculed and so forth. But uh, what is uh, interesting is that one can imagine the president receiving some briefing saying that we have some methods and uh, you know, everything is uh, getting very difficult, economy, hundreds of thousands of people dying and so forth. You know, is there a way we can adapt this for medical purposes? And I'm pretty sure that in the background of President Trump's uh, comments, and he may not have realized that what he was uh, uh, giving away, if you will, was uh, this concept of adapting some of these technologies for the medical side. And that is likely what he's referring to. Even though it sounded crazy, uh, <clears throat> there was probably, you know, some. Uh, intelligence behind that. And then I see the dis So why is uh, uh, terahertz physics has been a challenge? Why now? There's a growing interest becoming mainstream. Uh, it's been industrial, but moving more into the medical, uh, better performance, uh, miniaturization, as I described, and decreasing cost. Uh, in Star Trek has often been a predecessor of advanced technologies. You had the communicator, 
uh, leading to the mobile phone. You had the tricorder. You could even have a quadcorder because if you recall the tricorder <clears throat> in Star Trek was diagnostic, but if we can have both a diagnostic and a therapeutic aspect. And as I mentioned, this is more than just technology. There's a whole social dimension. There's a paradigm shift. There's a military applications, medical applications. So I've actually written a book called Waves uh, that describes this technology in a literary and broader setting for general public. So just some very quick closing thoughts. I presented around America. I presented in Europe, most recently at the Middle East Technical University. As you see here, I presented in Australia, at Melbourne, as I've described, and also in Asia. And my latest presentation, it's a great honor and pleasure to talk with Haibin and his colleagues here in Hong Kong by webinar. Uh, Isaac Newton, of course, founder of physics, was actually quite interested in biology. And this is his famous book, The uh, Principia, which of course outlined the three laws and so forth. But the very end of the Principia talks about biology, uh, the solid fibers of the nerves, the external organs of the senses to the brain, to the muscles and so forth. But these things cannot be explained in a few words to determine and demonstrate accurately the laws by which this electric and elastic spirit operates. Uh, I don't think Newton was thinking about proteins and protein electrodynamics, of course, but uh, those words electric and elastic spirit uh, encapsulate uh, very uh, well this concept. And finally, uh, Richard Feynman, <clears throat> great physicist, talked about the jigglings and wigglings, everything that living things do can be understood in terms of the jigglings and wigglings of atoms. And finally, I spoke about this at the Martin Karpfler Celebration Symposium in 2014. Uh, after his Nobel Prize, uh, his former students gave presentations. And uh, I asked him, what would you suggest? I would do the experiment on an enzyme. If it works, it would be significant. I proposed some experiments. I think it'd be great to do some of this with Hong Kong in collaboration. And uh, in the beginning, technology is not always pretty. I showed you that very broad spectrum of myoglobin and hemoglobin. But of course, things can progress. The field has progressed. The world has progressed. With COVID, we're looking for new paradigms so we can go to the moon or even Mars. So on that basis, uh, thank you very much and uh, open to questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I th there's one question from Osgur Yildirim about terahertz spectra of proteins being influenced by pH. Uh, is changing the state of uh, protein charge. That's indeed the case. Uh, but uh, in life, you know, pH doesn't change a lot. Of course, the pH is different in certain regions. Uh, obviously, inside the stomach, lower pH. Inside the mitochondria, there's a different pH and so forth. But over a certain period of time, the pH is fairly stable. But that's true. Uh, cancer cells, for example, have, I think, lower pH and, and so forth. So that will indeed change. But over the time of the scanning, uh, that's presumably going to be fairly stable but that is indeed an important uh, consideration. Hyben, uh, uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll transfer it to you. I'll stop sharing the screen for any questions that we can do uh, by video or by chat room. Yes. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, thank you uh, again for this very inspiring seminar. As always, you know, uh, worldwide. If I don't think I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I hear you now. You can hear me. Okay, that's another. So, so it's a very interesting, uh, exciting talk. So now it's uh, you know we like to uh, put uh, give the 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 participants the opportunity to communicate with you. So yes. that's another another question from the Michael Peck. So do you see this as a way to treat glioblastomas? Glioblastomas. Do you see that's in the chat? Yeah, I saw that. So uh, glioblastoma is always a, a very uh, difficult cancer, one of the essentially untreatable cancers. And um, this whole microtubule concept, I think, uh, is a general cancer platform. So whatever it may be, liver cancer, stomach cancer, you know, melanoma, and glioblastoma, they're, all of these cells are, of course, dividing by virtue of the Microtubules. So I think that if we are able to do a, an electromagnetic taxol, 
that manipulates, inhibits microtubule function in a localized way, yes, uh, you, you could have a device, perhaps during craniotomy, where you uh, put it on top of the glioblastoma, you effectively are dosing it with taxol, but electromagnetically. So that would be quite effective for glioblastoma. I don't think that the terahertz radiation is going, it, with current technology, going to go through the cranium and go through the skin and get into the brain non-invasively. So it may be combined with uh, a craniotomy or uh, another device to introduce it locally. Uh, the advantage of terahertz is becoming clear with these miniaturizations, so we can have very small devices endoscopically or handheld to do that. Uh, there are techniques with uh, glioblastoma of having localized drugs, uh, but uh, the electromagnetic methods could offer some you know, advantages. Another interesting aspect of electromagnetic methods, this is kind of related to Osgur Yildirim's question about the pH, is that uh, there may be slightly different uh, frequencies, et cetera, for a particular person. And so you could potentially personalize or optimize the treatment for individual people based on whatever their uh, unique pH and environment is around their microtubules. Whereas Taxol, for example, is a pretty generic drug. You know, everybody gets the same Taxol. Uh, it's not a personalized drug, if you will. It's quite effective, but there's also the opportunity to personalize or optimize, you know, with this technology by tweaking those uh, frequencies. Yeah, so that has more questions. That's uh, an, another one the from uh, from the Sibyl, Sibyl Yaoxin. Uh, so ask you whether you could use terahertz to you know change the environmental condition, say to study the hydrogen bond network. Yeah, so I actually think that uh, terahertz obviously can be a very powerful way of a research setting to observe conformational changes, especially large-scale conformational changes uh, in proteins, uh, particularly around their hydrogen bonding network. But as I said, this has not been very successfully done because it's generally done with these broadband techniques that stimulate many frequencies, very complex spectra, difficult to interpret. But I think that if we use narrowband techniques that are probing specific uh, frequencies or combinations of frequencies that are sensitive to those hydrogen bonding networks, then it will not just have a more application medicine, but some of the research aspects that Sybil mentioned and others. And as I mentioned, the, the Middle East Technical University approach that we're going to be doing will be using uh, a narrow band source. Okay. So Again, so the, the Aru uh, ask you about re, about the, the pH effects, you know, about pH things. So he talking yeah, about- Yeah, so I, w I was answering that as well. I mean, in terms of pH, uh, the pH will vary um, in different parts of the body. I think uh, the pH is different in the, inside the mitochondria. If we're talking about cells, the pH is different inside the cell versus the outside of the cell. Uh, you know, mitochondria involve proton pumping and via the chemiosmotic system and so forth. Uh, and of course, in terms of tissues, the inside of the stomach is lower pH than the rest of the tissues, et cetera. So there are variability in pH and that will vary the charges. But I think that uh, pH is relatively stable uh, over the time of uh, scanning. So if we're scanning something and we're looking for a certain protein, its charge distribution is likely to be fairly stable. You know, pH doesn't change that rapidly as far as I know. <clears throat> yeah. And so while the motion is changing, the charge uh, is remaining constant. And of course, the very interesting hypothesis, if we have the charge changing at the same time as the motion changing, it's just much more complex. But I don't think, I think we can assume the charge to be roughly constant. Okay. So that's another question from Luca. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, he's asking about this uh, uh, ophthalmic application. What kind of yeah? So 
Luca and I have talked uh, earlier about the things on the surface. It's a very good method, directly method with current technology for hydration. So any you know, medical condition or cosmetic condition for that matter that relates to hydration, I think can be very early applications of terahertz because it's so sensitive to hydration. So obviously ocular, te ocular te tears, excuse me, you know, the hydration status of the cornea and so forth, uh, and the sclera and, and et cetera, can be, I think, very re readily adapted uh, or applied and, and used. So I think that's a very clear application. Another one is cataract density. I think that can also be done. The question will be, you know, how does that compete with, you know, more conventional techniques? For the retina, I think that that's more difficult because you're going into this water uh, through the vitreous body and so forth. But as I mentioned, most of the terahertz studies that show lack of penetration are broadband studies or are higher frequency, et cetera. So if we take those four principles I described of lower frequency, a narrow band, pulsed and higher power, though there may be a possibility of reaching the retina non-invasively. Okay, very, very exciting. Yeah, so uh, I think, you know, all the good things have come to the end. So it's almost uh, like, uh, you know, uh, the end of the, the seminar is already close to uh, hour and a half. <laughs> so it's quite long seminar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're starting, but it's, it's like a party. So uh, maybe we, we thank the, the again one more time for the inspiring talk. And we always can get together through the room. Yeah, so uh, I think one of the ideas is this is a little bit of background for you and your colleagues and other sure. people to think about. And let's uh, try to arrange some sort of follow-up uh, discussion, yeah. maybe to brainstorm. I yeah. really think the, the microtubule <clears throat> and or the uh, luciferase, the bioluminescence, right. will be very key experiments to explore. Exactly, exactly. So because you know now we are using uh, the the department room. Uh, so uh, there's one more question. Let me see. Oh, I okay. see. Yeah. So it's a um, uh, we I, we could uh, do the like say after this, then we can talk uh, yeah, on the Skype or what whatever. So because as as you suggest, this also being recorded. Maybe some colleague they could not make today. The they could watch the video later on. Please, please share. Okay, so then we, we can, you know, do, uh, chat a little bit uh, if you have time uh, after we uh, close this session. Okay? Yeah, so we close and then uh, you can uh, message me and we can figure out. Right exactly, after. exactly. So so with that, I, I really appreciate your, you. you know, very nice talk. So hope as, as, as some colleague, uh, Mike, Michael, uh, comment, uh, it's your great efforts to coordinate all the people worldwide. Let's hope yeah. this field Let's will hope. grow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So th thank you everybody for, for your participants. Hope you have a very good day and stay safe in this special uh, era as uh, yeah. Organ share with us. Let's waiting for his device to, to combat the <laughs> next uh, virus. Hopefully not this one. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Bye. bye.